see for today. Uh, to briefly take you through the agenda for today's symposium, we'll commence with the opening remarks by the Honorable Chief Justice, Dr. Foster Hosilijayo. Subsequently, we will have our first session. Uh, it's consisting of a panel uh, with the theme leaders, decision makers uh, throughout the mediation process and the mediation system design. Our keynote speaker is none other than the internationally renowned uh, mediation, uh, mediator, sorry, Bruce Edwards, uh, founder of Edwards Mediation Academy. Following uh, the keynote address, we will have uh, a distinguished panel of discussants, including uh, the Honorable Minister of Justice and Attorney General, uh, Emmanuel Ujirashe Buja. We'll have the uh, we have Justice Eme Karimunda, who's the Vice Chairperson of the, of the Court Mediation Advisory Committee in Rwanda. We will have Ms. Kamheta Sainzoga, the CEO of BRD, and uh, Mr. Mirenje John, the CEO of Prime Insurance Rwanda. The session will be moderated by Mr. Stephen Ruziviza, who's the CEO of the Private Sector Federation. After the panel, uh, after the panel discussion, there will be a Q&A uh, where the, the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions and share their thoughts about what will be discussed today. And uh, we will give a few minutes to our panelists and uh, to respond to the questions raised or comments. Following the discussions and the Q&A, we'll move to a recommendation session. Uh, where we'll discuss and propose actionable steps for improving the mediation, uh, mediation in the financial sector. Uh, lastly, we'll have uh, the privilege of hearing from the Deputy uh, Governor of the Central Bank and uh, who will deliver the closing remarks uh, for this uh, symposium. So that's the agenda for today. And uh, without further ado, as mentioned in my introduction, it's an, an honor for us to have today uh, the Honorable Chief Justice, uh, who will deliver his welcome remarks. We express our gratitude to you, sir, and welcome you to take the stage. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Kamikazi. Uh, distinguished uh, uh, participants um, from um, various um, uh, financial institutions, uh, CEOs, MDs, colleagues from uh, the judiciary, uh, Mr. Bruce and uh, Susan Edwards, uh, dear participants, I am really very pleased to have such an opportunity to exchange uh, with the leadership of the financial institution present on the benefits of using mediation to resolve financial disputes and thus maintain and strengthen a good relationship between consumers of financial services and financial services providers. Uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking you all, distinguished participants, uh, for having devoted the time to attend this uh, session. A special thank you goes to distinguished speakers, as uh, Mrs. Kamikaze uh, listed them, our keynote speaker, Mr. Bruce Edwards, international mediator and the founder of the uh, Edward Mediation Academy, and our distinguished uh, discussant, here, I'd like to apologize for uh, Honorable Minister of Justice, who will not be able to be with us because uh, they have a meeting in the Prime Minister uh, office. But we have um, a distinguished uh, discuss, the, the discussant, my colleague from uh, the Supreme Court, uh, Dr. Uh, Eme Karimunda, and um, the um, CEO of um, the Bank Rwanda Development, Development Rwanda, uh, Rwanda Development Bank, but also the CEO of the Prima Insurance uh, Rwanda. Uh, 
this is a special uh, session really dedicated to financial uh, institution to uh, a captain of the financial industry and um, as someone who also used to be in the financial sector uh, i see it as a privilege for the judiciary uh, to exchange with uh, um, distinguished uh, uh, leaders of the in the financial industry on the best way to manage this bit. We are talking about the management of this bit, not necessarily uh, the resolution of this bit, because uh, as I know, it is better to have no dispute at all, but uh, it is not possible to have no dispute as uh, we know it. So mediation as a dispute resolution method, alternative to litigation in a court of law, is a private, confidential, consensual, and no adversary uh, dispute resolution mechanism in which a mediator who is a neutral party uh, facilitates a settlement agreement by guiding the parties toward a shared understanding of the dispute and of their respective interest. To resolve financial disputes between consumers and financial institutions like uh, banks, financial companies, life insurers, general insurers, capital market service license, or licensed financial advisors and uh, insurance uh, brokers, litigation is not the only solution as mediation have proved to be sometimes uh, more beneficial. In the banking sector, for example, it is recognized that uh, one of the many benefits of uh, mediation in this sector is that it allows parties to resolve disputes quickly and efficiently. Banks are often large organizations, as we know, with many departments, with many employees, which can make it difficult to resolve disputes in a timely manner. Mediation in the field of banking allows parties to come together and work through the issues without the need for a lengthy legal uh, process. This can save a bank a significant amount of uh, time, but also a significant, uh, a significant amount of uh, money while preserving uh, the relationship with uh, the business relationship between parties. If I take also the example of the insurance industry, mediation can be used to resolve disputes between policy holders and insurance company. These disputes, as we know, often arise over issues such as uh, denied claims, a party disputing a uh, rejected insurance claim, they can arise also over the interpretation of policy language. We know that sometimes the policy wording uh, may be uh, confusing, but also they may arise over the value of uh, damages, but also they may arise when insurance uh, fraud is suspected, when the insurance company feels that the value of the claim is overestimated, et cetera. So mediation allows parties to come together and discuss these issues in a private and confidential setting without the need for a public trial. So this can be beneficial for both policy holders and insurance company, as we know. So overall, where is suited for uh, dealing with financial disputes, financial service mediation is now accepted as uh, a smart, economical, and confidential mechanism for clients and service provider alike, as to help to reach a mutually beneficial agreement that not only solves the problem at hand, but also maintains and strengthens existing uh, relationships. This morning, I am glad to have uh, with us, as uh, Mr. Kamikaze said, um, we are very glad to have with us uh, Mr. Uh, Bruce Edward, who is one of the pioneers 
in developing mediation as a tool for resolving commercial uh, disputes in the United States. As a professional international mediator for more than three decades, Mr. Edwards is actively involved in mediating complex disputes while also helping different governments and institutions across the world to build the capacity in mediation through his well-known mediation institution, that is the Edward Mediation Academy. The judiciary of Rwanda is committed to continuously explore ways to deliver timely and quality justice for all. In this regard, we will continue to join hands with our stakeholders in promoting mediation as one of the best ways to expeditiously, confidentially, effectively, and efficiently resolve disputes, including financial disputes, the subject matter of uh, today's uh, symposium. Uh, distinguished participants, as I conclude my uh, very short remarks, allow me once again to thank you for uh, having devoted your time to attend this session, and hope that uh, you will find financial service mediation to be a useful tool to resolve financial disputes, and thus ensure the good continuation of business relationships and the growth of your respective companies, and of course, the growth and economic development of our country. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Chief Justice, for ushering us into our, our next session. Uh, which will focus on the role of uh, leadership in mediation uh, in, the financial, in the financial sector. Before we get to the panel, I'd like to uh, welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Bruce Edwards. As uh, the Chief Justin mentioned, he's the founder of Edwards Mediation Academy. Sir, you're welcome to, to deliver your remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> With your permission, I will walk because I'm more comfortable getting closer to people and engaging you in conversation. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction by the Honorable Chief Justice. I'll do my best to live up to that uh, remark. Uh, welcome to the, the Honorable Deputy Chief Justice, the President of the Bar Association, and all our distinguished guests. As I was introduced, I'm Bruce Edwards. As a pioneer of the mediation process in the United States, I've now been mediating for uh, approximately 35 years and have uh, helped co-found and run the largest um, provider of commercial mediation services in the United States, if not beyond, including um, uh, the opportunity to mediate a number of cases emanating from financial institutions, banks, lenders, as well as a host of insurance matters I'll talk about shortly. Um, how many people in the audience have actually been in a mediation, just for curiosity's sake? Good. A couple people, fabulous. Hopefully the goal today, from my standpoint, is to uh, <coughs> light the fuse of interest in better understanding this process and how you can use it to your advantage, uh, to your company's advantage and to the collective community and growth of Rwanda's advantage. Um, <coughs> I always try and start my conversations by understanding why people might want to listen to me. And I think the answer to that, although we're going to invite questions here shortly, I think the answer to that is kind of what's in it for our institutions? What's in it for Rwanda? And I'll start with kind of a macroeconomic view, which is this. I think if companies are looking to, uh, be, to have Rwanda become a business hub uh, in Africa, if, if companies are looking to do increased commerce, looking for direct foreign investment, then several things are required. Obviously, you need a vibrant business community, which by all accounts you, you have. Uh, to use the Honorable Chief Justice words, you need timely and quality justice, which you also have. But you also need other tools. And mediation, what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, is one of those tools that can afford your institutions the opportunity for dispute resolution that adds value not just to your bottom line, but to the sort of human side of your companies as well. Um, <clears throat> I want to introduce you to a topic that is near and dear to my heart uh, as I 
travel the world and talk to a lot of uh, governments, institutions, and mediators, trying to implement mediation in a variety of segments of society, starting with the judiciary and moving beyond. And that topic is uh, what I call the cost of conflict. And um, I was the chairman of the board of directors of our company for a number of years and had to familiarize myself with balance sheets and financial documents. And I became aware of line items for all major expenditures, including leaseholds from our 26 offices, capital improvements, uh, employee expenses, travel and entertainment expenses, all the various line items that go into running a company. But what I didn't see, I never saw a line item that said cost of conflict. And uh, talking with uh, CEOs and business leaders over the years, it's pretty clear we all as business leaders know what the cost of, of uh, maintaining a legal department is as a line item. We owe, know typically what the cost is on an annual basis of hiring outside counsel to defend claims against the company by employees, outside vendors, people who may be hurt by products. Uh, but unfortunately, that's kind of where the conversation stops for most leaders. And yet, it's really only where the conversation should begin. I don't know how many of you are aware of some of the studies that show that CEOs spend somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of their time managing conflict, both within their organizations and, and outward facing conflicts as well. Um, there's other studies that show that employees, if you lose a key employee, it costs about 150 percent of that employee's salary by the time you search for another one, retrain that new employee, and ultimately replace him or her. And there's a variety of studies out there that sort of scratch at the surface of understanding the cost of conflict. But again, that's only the beginning. Because when you think about it, co uh, companies that are in conflict pay a big price. They pay prices potentially in terms of reputation. In the United States, there's all sorts of uh, Google surveys about um, um, canvassing employees about whether they like where they work or not. And companies get ranked based on uh, their employers. And uh, those companies that are often in conflict, particularly internal conflicts having to do with employment issues, find themselves lower down the list. Um, if a company is in litigation, uh, I do a lot of mediation of large claims involving construction projects, environmental claims, in addition to insurance issues and beyond. And I see firsthand the number of employees within a company who are tasked with trying to assist lawyers in developing a case for litigation. Whether it's your IT department having to spend hours sorting through five years of emails with keyword searches trying to figure out what documents are going to be relevant to a litigation, or it's somebody else that's um, uh, involved in digging through archived documents to try and uh, support the lawyer's request for document production. I could go on, but that is the continued cost of conflict. <clears throat> and it is a cost that is, uh, at one level, uh, difficult to calculate. We're in conversations with economic departments in universities, as well as um, uh, other uh, um, accounting firms to see if we can partner with someone to better quantify the true cost of conflict. But the bottom line is this, conflict is ubiquitous. Conflict is part of the human condition, and therefore it's part of the business condition. And you all don't need to be told that. You deal with it every day. The question is really focusing on what is the true impact of that conflict. Let me turn to more of a microeconomic perspective, one that probably uh, addresses maybe more of the answer to the question of why you are here. Uh, I'll start with the uh, financial institutions first. Last week I was in Cairo um, doing a number of things with courts and government officials, but one day we went to the uh, Egyptian uh, Financial Regulatory Agency, met with the Deputy Minister of Finance and a host of other government officials who interestingly were trying and have been trying to implement mediation within their financial institutions. And they wanted our assistance in trying to train mediators who had particular background and expertise in financial markets. And that's a slightly different conversation about the need for substantive expertise in a trained mediation community. But in this instance, that's what they were looking for and we tried to deliver. At the same time, we addressed an audience of over 100 leaders like yourselves of businesses and financial institutions. <clears throat> um, one doesn't have to look very far to appreciate the full range of conflict that, that evolves within financial institutions. While I've been on the road these past several weeks, I've been closely following some of the travails uh, that have impacted in the United States several key banks uh, that have gone under and obviously jeopardize the financial stability of a number of institutions within our country, if not beyond. <clears throat> um, 
But uh, over the last uh, several decades, as His Honor was suggesting, I've mediated, as well as um, uh, others within my company, uh, a number of cases involving financial institutions. And to give you an idea of how well entrenched mediation is now in our legal system and our broader culture, we're just one company. We have to be the largest, happen to be the largest. But we did 18,000 disputes last year based on about four to 500 people like myself who mediate many days a week, if not full time. And those cases range from all different kinds of backgrounds and subject matters. But as it relates to the financial industry, what we, we uh, live and work about 30 miles north of Silicon Valley. So a lot of uh, disputes arise from startup businesses, financing and uh, related claims. Um, claims can be as straightforward and simple as uh, lending disputes between a lender and a borrower. They can be as complex as what we worked on in 2010 after the subprime collapse of a number of banks in the United States <coughs> um, and all sorts of disputes in between. If money can be lent, obviously disputes can arise. Leases, obviously the same. Um, and just a variety of types of claims that come in uh, through the financial sector. Um, with regard to the, those of you in the room who represent the insurance side of the business world, I'll tell you a little story. 35 years ago, uh, when I left the practice of law to begin a new process that was unknown to most people called mediation, and we were trying to implement mediation that had been used historically in family law disputes, but bring it into the world of commercial litigation. And I came from a litigation firm uh, in San Francisco where my background had been in learning how to take cases to trial, like most lawyers are taught in law school and in their law firms. And yet, I believe there was this different process, this one that could uh, work if you just brought people together sooner and you engaged in a dialogue about what gave rise to the dispute and you let people talk openly and honestly and sometimes with emotion. And when that was allowed to pr proceed, m sort of magical things happened. People started to work together. They often found compromise. They came up with creative solutions. And in the end, they managed to resolve disputes more often than not in a timely, cost-effective manner. And so we developed this company around this concept. And I would knock on doors of law firms, many of which would close their door in my face, saying, we know how to litigate cases. Thank you very much. We don't need this new process. But when I knocked on the door of the insurance industry, a different thing happened. Because by law in the United States, as I'm sure it is here, insurance companies are bound to manage claims fairly in a timely fashion and fairness to policyholders. And the insurance company said, wait, you've got a process that might save us time and money. Tell us more about it. And so we spoke in the first instance to the insurance industry, who fairly quickly became an early champion of our efforts to implement mediation in the United States. And over the last 35 years, Someone once described the insurance industry as the mother's milk of settlement because so often there is insurance in a variety of different kinds of claims and disputes. I'll give you some examples. Um, different kinds of policies in our country include general liability or commercial policies that manage all sorts of risks from the simplest slip and fall at a hotel casino in Las Vegas to the collapse of the six-story uh, condominium project in northern Florida that killed over 100 people a year ago, which incidentally, as a side note, ouch, hopefully that's insured. <laughs> um, it's a, um, uh, that particular case, which involved the, the horrific collapse of that uh, condominium project and the death of so many of those people sleeping in their beds or trying to escape that night, would have involved litigation that took over five years in most instances. It was resolved through mediation in somewhere between six and nine months, just as an example of how this process can work. But back to my comments with regard to different kinds of insurance policies, uh, there's all sorts of cases that arise pursuant to uh, general liability policies. Um, we write uh, in our country a variety of other specialized policies. There's errors and omissions policies for a variety of professionals. So if you sue your doctor for medical malpractice, you'll implicate an errors and omissions policy. If you sue a structural engineer, and because in this case a building collapsed, you'll um, activate an errors and omissions policy, uh, and so on. Any professional you can think of probably has the opportunity to be insured through an E&O policy. 
directors and officers liability for members of boards of directors who are often thought to be um, exercising their discretion outside of a normal business judgment rule may get sued for that behavior. And then directors and officers insurance will kick in and when it does they'll be defended. Um, construction. I work on a lot of large construction project disputes and there's a variety of different kinds of insurance products that are implicated in the construction world from those kinds of builders risk policies to surety and bond claims uh, to uh, owner controlled insurance programs to additional insuring obligations I could go on but in the construction world insurance really dictates many of the relationships and leverage points uh, in the mediation process and so there's, there's just a, a, a sort of a, a rich history of the insurance uh, participation in developing the world of mediation. And we need to collaborate with business, we need to collaborate with industry, be it financial or insurance, construction or otherwise, as we set about to try and uh, resolve these claims. As His Honor was saying in his opening remarks, so much of the uh, mediation in the insurance world turns on uh, how different policies are interpreted and whether or not um, um, in a large uh, environmental claim uh, there is policy exclusionary language for uh, environmental damage uh, or other types of cases that really turn on the um, uh, interpretation of key words in policies. So my point is this as it relates to the insurance industry, you are a meaningful participant. You were, at least in our country, a driving force behind the value of the mediation process. And now nobody goes to court in the United States without first going to mediation. There was a law review article I read just over a year and a half ago that conducted a survey amongst lawyers and courts and found that in our federal judicial system, less than 1% of cases actually get to trial by a judge for resolution. The vast, vast majority of cases either get dismissed along the way or find themselves in some mediated scenario. Um, it's a slightly lesser number for our state courts, but it's still less than 5% of cases end up in trial. And that's because people like you have educated themselves and made um, uh, themselves committed to this process. So why are we talking about all of this? What's, what is the reason underlying today's conversation from my perspective? The reason is I want to educate you about the value of this process, not because there's something in it for me, but because there's something in it for each of you. And because what I've found in the United States so often, and I have in mediating almost every day, I've done over 8,000 mediations, and there have been a number of days where I've sat with people like you, leaders of their companies, CEOs, after two or three or four years of litigation, find themselves in a room with me saying, how did I let my company get here? And I say, that's a very good question. And it so often happens because, uh, as many of you may have experienced, you tend to trust the people around you. You trust your financial department. You trust your legal department. And when the legal department comes to you and says, gee, we've been sued, and we want to defend our product or our reputation or uh, this contract, and I think we can win, or an outside lawyer comes to you with the same message, you want to hear it. You want to believe it. After all, it's a satisfying message. We didn't do anything wrong. And what do you do? you tend to turn the problem over to the legal department or the outside counsel. And over time, what happens then is you just unknowingly continue to fund that mechanism of dispute resolution. I often tell people when I'm talking that the danger in life is not knowing what you don't know. The danger in life is not knowing what you don't know. And mediation is a new process. There's nothing shameful about not knowing it. We're frankly just starting to teach the next generation of CEOs in business schools about mediation and its vast potential. But it's not too late for you to learn, and that's why we're here. And what we're really trying to do is help you understand the magic of this process. And as the, the Honorable Chief Justice was describing earlier, Mediation involves bringing people together uh, in a timely fashion, meaning usually sooner rather than later, to talk with counsel about trying to resolve a matter. And I spoke yesterday to a room full of lawyers, explaining to them there's still a valued role for lawyers in this process. We're not trying to replace lawyers by any stretch. We're simply trying to help train them to have a broader range of tools to serve their clients better.
And so in this mediation process, there's a meaningful role for them to participate. We go around trying to teach people their mediation advocacy skills as they are distinct from litigation or arbitration advocacy skills. So the lawyers are our partners in all of this, but that's not an excuse to sort of lay off and pass off responsibility for decision making to them. And what people in this room need to do is first understand and appreciate the value of this process. And once you do, then the challenge is to participate if not directly, through trusted people in your C-suite or other sort of, of governance within the organization. Because when people come into the process, they're going to experience it firsthand. And life is about experience. I don't pretend for a moment that you listening to my words for 15 or 20 minutes is necessarily going to persuade you. But I can guarantee you that if you go through a process of mediation that's well managed by a, a competent mediator, you'll come out of that process and the light bulb will have gone off you'll say, wow, this is a valuable tool. Not for every case. There are those disputes that need to find their way to the court system. That's why we have courts. We need legal precedent. We need sometimes to have judicial interpretation of contract clauses. The example I think of and share with people is the 9-11 catastrophe in the United States involving twin towers that were collapsed after they were struck by airplanes came down to a legal determination of a single sentence. Was it a single occurrence? under the language of the policy because it evolved from a hijacked airplane or a series of hijacked airplanes? Or was it multiple occurrences, therefore triggering a sec second uh, policy limit of a billion dollars? There in that one sentence laid a billion dollar question and it needed to go to court for judicial determination. So there's a role in all of this for lawyers, for judges, uh, but there's also a, a role for mediators and the mediation process. So I hope that I've at least um, stimulated you enough to invite some questions when I have the privilege of participating with esteemed colleagues on the panel about the value of mediation and particularly how you can use it to your advantage, not just to improve the bottom line for your companies, as I've said, but to, to improve uh, the, the human nature of your company and all the while benefiting uh, the greater Rwanda. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll look forward to answering your questions in a few minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Edwards. And I hope that after this session, our CEO will uh, be able to invest the 30 minutes that they spend solving conflicts elsewhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. For the next session, I'd like to invite uh, our moderator, Mr. Stephen Ruzibiza, CEO of PSF, to um, join us up here and also welcome uh, our panelists. I think Stephen, we'll, you will you will introduce the the speakers. Thank you very much. Protocol, can you have microphones, please? Thank you, Fiona. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice, uh, delegates here present. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity. First of all, to refresh my legal memory. It has been a while. So, if I commit a professional offence here take care of the responsibilities that you have. You have consumed risks voluntarily, so don't blame me. I have a good panelist, and allow me to call one by one. But before doing that, dispute is part of life. And we meet it at one time or the other. It teaches us to solve problems and learn new solutions. Today we are focusing on mediation as a way of resolving these disputes. It is still young as we have heard from the keynote speaker. It is only around 40 years old, I think, compared to arbitration, which is over 100 years, and conventional court litigation that is as old as humanity. So you can imagine what we are going to discuss. This is still a baby. Don't overemphasize it. In commercial areas, it's again the literature shows that it is over 40 years, yes, applied, and the economy is around 147, 45 are applied in arbitration. So there are not many that they are taking up this concept. Without much ado, uh, allow me to introduce the panelists who are going to give us their insights into this one. Uh, my Lord, Justice Amy. Please come. 
uh, CEO of BRD. In that chrono, my time is delayed as RDB, but uh, not. Appreciate it. CEO of Prime Insurance, Johnny Mirenji. Thank you so much. Can we have an additional mic, if possible? That, okay. Thank you so much. Let me start with the Lord Justice. As the fire, fire Vice Chairperson of the Arbitration Court Mediation Advisory Committee that monitors the functionality of court cases referred by judges, what have you learned in this uh, arbitration in financial sector? Are you satisfied with the performance? Thank you so much. <coughs> um, thank you, Honorable Chief Justice, a distinguished uh, guest. Uh, I think the question is, the question is uh, a little bit straightforward, whether I'm satisfied or not. But uh, I think we have, uh, it is a journey, it is a process, like uh, the Honorable CG and the Mr. Bruce have mentioned, uh, it is a process. A process that Rwanda uh, started uh, around 2008 with commercial cases in the commercial courts. And uh, by then we had uh, a civil procedure code which uh, allowed a kind of uh, mandatory mediation in all commercial cases. And uh, the result uh, in that time were, were really speaking for themselves. Uh, I recall that uh, in 2008, we had nearly 800 cases resolved through uh, mediation in commercial courts. But uh, uh, afterwards, I think there was um, a dropping down of the cases due to different reasons. And uh, one of the reasons is also the fact that uh, the the law changed a little bit, and we had a new civil procedure code in 2012, uh, which uh, uh, reformulated uh, the procedures before commercial court, and uh, initially it left uh, mediation in pre-trial uh, pre uh, process, which is conducted mostly by registrars rather than budget, by judges. And. Uh, uh, the lawmaker introduced again a provision in, um, for mediation uh, in the Civil Procedure Code of 2018. Now uh, trying to remind judges that they should, um, uh, in fact, also mediate some cases. And I think since a couple of years ago, I think uh, 2020, we uh, the Honorable CG introduced uh, this uh, process of uh, professional and uh, private mediators, and they, they established the committee uh, uh, in, in which uh, myself and uh, many other uh, uh, high caliber colleagues are, uh, uh, are following up on a daily basis. So, uh, uh, I might say that the, so far, the results are positives. I, might, uh, I, I don't have a negative uh, picture of uh, what is going on. Uh, as uh, you mentioned, it is a, a baby, and we know that uh, uh, the baby has a process in order to, to grow up. But uh, we still see that um, uh, there are uh, efforts to be made. Some of these efforts uh, have been uh, uh, I think there is a process going on. We know that the, the Chief Justice, the former Chief Justice and um, Mrs. Bernadette, who are also members of the committee, uh, they met the CEOs of uh, the banking sector. Uh, I think uh, we, there has been a kind of uh, awareness in uh, insurance companies. There have been different forums to uh, encourage uh, lawyers to embrace the process of mediation. Uh, so, we can see that there is a, there is a, a change, a positive change. Uh, the numbers of cases in mediation is growing. 
uh, slowly. Uh, for instance, today we have, um, we have noticed that since 2019 up to today, uh, the insurance cases which are resolved through mediation have increased. Uh, since 2019 up to today, we have nearly 180 cases uh, uh, resolved through uh, mediation. Of course, the number is not that big because if you take uh, 180, you divide it by 62 courts and they, they f on a period of uh, four years, you find nearly 0 0.7, uh, which is less than one <coughs> case uh, per court and per year. So, but uh, at least the trend is there. Uh, we know that uh, today, in fact, this month, we, ha we got a, a positive feedback uh, from Onyeru Genge, uh, from Mogasavo, from Rubavu, uh, <coughs> that there are a lot of uh, insurance companies which have embraced uh, the process uh, of uh, mediation. Uh, for the banking sector, we are also seeing that um, there are banks which, uh, in fact, uh, are positively moving towards uh, mediation. So, and uh, <coughs> Uh, on um, the side of the committee, and I think this uh, will be the side, of, will be also the opinion of the Honorable Chief Justice and of the judiciary. Uh, we think that uh, the commercial cases are, in fact, uh, the cases which are mostly eligible for mediation, uh, uh, because uh, there are several factors which uh, lead to dispute. Uh, Mr. Edward has uh, mentioned some of them. But some of these factors, uh, when they lead to dispute, the dispute is very clear in the financial sector. Most of the time, the dispute is, can be established already. They know the, uh, the amount of money which has not been paid, if it is a case of uh, a bank contract. They know the amount of uh, penalty interest which has to be paid. They know the amount of uh, ordinary interest which has to be paid. And now, under Article 2112 of the banking law, uh, we know that uh, the, uh, the, the, the amount of uh, interest cannot go, cannot go beyond the double of uh, the capital. And um, uh, the, 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 the Supreme Court has been insisting on in this by uh, uh, developing uh, a consistent and coherent case law, uh, indicating, to the bank sector, indicating to the bank sector that Article uh, 112 of the banking law should be observed. It means that whatever be the case, in any uh, bank uh, dispute, uh, we, the lawyers and the, the, the management for the bank, they know, uh, in fact, beforehand, uh, what would be the, the, the last uh, outcome of, of the adjudication process. But for the, uh, the insurance company, I think the insurance company, my personal view is that um, there are two aspects uh, that have to be taken into account. Uh, because uh, there is this financial aspect, which is already uh, based on the principles that are in presidential decree, and which are also very clear, which are very established. I think uh, it is uh, even easier to mediate an insurance case than to mediate any other case, because the formula for getting to the result, except for moral damages, but all other damages, the formula is already in the presidential decree. And that was the courts do, in fact. The courts would apply only the formula which is in the, in, in the, in the, in the presidential decree. So uh, it is something which can be done either uh, with the, 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 the in-house lawyers of, uh, of the insurance companies or with uh, a, a, a lawyer who has skills in mediation with the help of the lawyer for the, 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 for the victim. But also the other aspect for the insurance company, which uh, for me, I consider that is important that we, uh, we take uh, it into account is that um, most of the cases we are receiving in the court are related to insurance, insurance of uh, motorcycles. And uh, these are insurance uh, uh, related to accident, to mostly to road accidents, uh, where th there, is, uh, s there are serious injuries or in sometimes there are deaths. And um, the victims are either uh, widows or orphans. Uh, these are uh, people who, in fact, are claiming uh, the, 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 uh, 
uh, it's a financial compensation for their survival because they have lost a loved one. And uh, that brings a the kind of a, uh, psychological aspect to the insurance companies, which would rather uh, bring them towards the value of a mediation, because the value of a mediation, it carries with it, in my humble understanding, uh, the, 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 the humanness. Uh, and think the, 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 these two aspects, the, the aspect of uh, humanness, but uh, combined with uh, the fact that uh, uh, calculations of uh, damages are uh, already pre-established in the presidential decree would rather lead to, finan uh, to financial companies and especially the, uh, the insurance companies uh, to embrace more and more uh, the, uh, the, the, the mediation process. The challenge there is that we don't have uh, the basic salary for the, the basis of calculating these damages. Well, I, uh, Are we going to have a mediation in that area as well? well I think that is uh, uh, the, the issue for basic salary has already been resolved through case law, mm -hmm. and the uh, courts are uh, there is a there are several case laws delivered by the Supreme Court which have established the basic salary while waiting for uh, proper regulations from the regulator, the Minister of Labor, and the, maybe the Parliament. But already we have a case law which have established the basic salary and which are followed by all, all the courts. So that the, the, the issue for the basic salary uh, is not, in fact, a, a, an issue today. It is not a problem today. Uh, so uh, I think, in short, I, I, I had, um, I had uh, I collected a couple of data about the insurance companies and how insurance companies are, uh, uh, are embracing in mediation. If you, I, I still have like one minute, I can ask it to the people in, techno, in technical computer there to put them and uh, to give an indication uh, on how, I don't know how you could read them, but the, uh, the first line in green, it, uh, all uh, insurance companies which uh, are uh, in Rwanda uh, today and uh, on the, the, the the second column here are the courts. As I was mentioning, we have uh, 62 courts, but uh, uh, insurance companies, they start from uh, pre, uh, uh, intermediate courts. And uh, I don't know whether we should share this with uh, Honorable CG, maybe you can share this with the CEOs so that they can have the, the data. But these are cases which were resolved. In, uh, and we see, uh, you will see that uh, in uh, some uh, for some companies there is uh, a repeating uh, zero figure uh, uh, to find that in all courts uh, from uh, intermediate court to the supreme court and uh, throughout the process we find that there are insurance companies which uh, have uh, never embraced the process uh, of mediation thank you for putting them on the spot right thank so you. zero means they have not taken up mediation that's it oh and nine means these have taken up the mediation. Exactly. And award for those who have taken up the mantle? Well, uh, for those who have, uh, who, who have already gone through mediation, that's what uh, I think Mr. Edward has uh, been mentioning, that we cannot, uh, in this form really, uh, persuade someone uh, to, to, to embrace mediation. But uh, the best way of uh, getting the persuasion through mediation is for you to get involved in the process of mediation. Once you have resolved one case of a mediation, you understand that the next case should also go for mediation. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it has been so informative and um, thank you. Uh, see you appreciate. I would say in one sentence that you are a very resourceful person, especially in the Rwandan economic transformation. You head uh, a financial institution, and one of the pillars of the NST one is economic transformation, access to finance, of course, uh, inclusive finance. What happens in between is dispute. As a financial institutions, only that uh, we haven't seen a report on the banks you have so much legal litigations between parties. Suppliers and consumers come to financial institutions to get money. To avoid spending 30%, 40% of our time, your time addressing financial institutions, I mean uh, legal issues, 
what do you think is the role of mediation in all these uh, conflicts? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Honorable Chief Justice, Deputy uh, Governor of the Central Bank, all protocols observed. Um, I was looking at the table that was chaired by justice and I was like, if we had to do the same for banks, I think uh, BRD would be on the left-hand side. <laughs> we were, <laughs> in 2019, were the bank that had the most litigation in the market. And that's probably why when uh, former Chief Justice Professor Rugege started his tour of banks, he started with us. And there is a, a say that uh, Mr. Edwards mentioned that I think is very true. You don't know what you don't know. And the discussion with Professor Rugege started with him coming to introduce his practice as a practice that wants to promote mediation in the market. And in good old tradition, of course, Professor Rugege always ends up with a lecture. So we ended up not talking about his practice and we ended up talking about, we ended up getting a phenomenal lecture about the importance of mediation and arbitration in this market. And, and a few things stuck out of this conversation. The first one was a level of flexibility in the process, which as a bank that had a very large stock of litigation, uh, badly needed. The second one was that the process is led by a neutral person. And it's important because you can choose to use a judge or not use a judge. In the case that I'll, I'll highlight um, later on, we chose to use a commercial judge actually as a mediator, but with a clear understanding that this commercial judge was not acting as a judge, but as a, as a neutral party to, to both parties. And then the third one is something that is probably a little difficult to say in this room, but you're actually not at the mercy of judges. <laughs> because you can control what the final outcome is through the conversations that you have with the other party. So at any time, you can pull out of mediation or you can conclude the process. You can decide, you can change your mind in, in the middle of the process, change your position, and when the final settlement comes, you have full visibility on how you got to that end point, which in litigation is sometimes not the case. I think this is why you have so many appeals and so many complaints, is of course when we enter litigation, we have something in mind, and sometimes the end process is not what we had in mind, but we don't have visibility of what happened in between. So that idea of having predictability of the outcome was something that was, for us, in, at least as a bank, very attractive. Now, what were the advantages of mediation? We did our first test case in 2000 and um, we started in 2019 and continued throughout COVID. And the first one, which I like, Bruce mentioned it indirectly, is really the reputational risk. I think many CEOs of banks have found themselves on the front page of New Times with very nasty headlines. When you know deep down what the reality of the case is, but of course, the banks are kind of perceived as capitalists and we're seen as you know, the beatback wolves that want to fleece the population. And often the, the, the front line, you know, the headline on the newspaper, actually, you take a hit in terms of your reputational damage, even when you know very well that the other party is not acting or did not act in good faith. So that's the first advantage. The second one is as banks, of course, and I'm sure insurance are the same, we all operate on a 12 month lifeline. So we start the year January and we kind of plan the end of the year in December. So if you have a large litigation case like the one we had that went through mediation, it makes a huge difference in your balance sheet if you're able to recover or not recover, or if you have to take a provision or not take a provision on this case. And with litigation, the decision to take a provision or not, of course, is between you and your external auditors. With mediation, it's not, because it means if you start a case, let's say, in January, because the final settlement is stamped by the court, there's no possibility of appeal. So what you've agreed in mediation is not appealable, which gives you a sense of certainty. If you're able to close the mediation before December, that saves you from taking provisions on this case, and that gives you kind of clarity on what your risk is versus this particular case in terms of financial resources. So within a year, you can close a case and know what will be your position at the end of the financial year, which for, for banks or for institutions that have you know, a lot of cases can be very material when it comes to your financials. The third one is, is something that you know, um, Justice mentioned, 
which is often when you have a case that involves many parties, there's a lot of emotions involved. You know, I think there's a famous case that happened once in, in Rwanda after the war. Justice Busingi used to like to, to mention it, where two parties di had a dispute. Uh, they had a dispute around 5,000 and then 5,000 francs, which is like $5. And they went to court and the, the court ruled in favor of the plaintiff and said, you know, the other party needs to give you the 5,000. And the party that so-called won appealed because they said, no, 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 I want the other bill that I gave him the other time, you know? I don't want his new 5,000, I was the other 5,000. Right? Which is, I think, the best illustration that sometimes it's not about the 5,000. It's about having your emotions validated, having your feelings validated, feeling like, you know, if you feel that you've been, you've been taken advantage of, that you've had kind of emotional retribution. And the litigations does not allow for that because you enter the courts, even the way you're set up, uh, you know, you're going to fight. And there's a winner and there's a loser. But in mediation, and I really want to, to congratulate Chief Justice because when we had our first mediation, I'll talk about the case in Hunda Mahoro. When we took the decision to go for mediation, the judge's first reaction was to say, can we move the chairs? And we were in a court, we were in a commercial court, actually. And he said, let's move the chairs. And I was like, why are we moving the chairs in a commercial court? And for him, it was very clear that we need to psychologically see ourselves in a circle, almost like gachacha, as opposed to two opposing parties on a bench. So we moved all the tables, you know, I was in the room, <laughs> removed all the tables, the chairs, and then we set ourselves in a circle. And that alone meant that the parties that, were, that had taken BRD to court felt that this was starting to be a safe space for them to, 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 to have their emotions heard and understood. Now, of course, very selfishly, <laughs> if you're dealing with emotions, you're also getting a lot of information that you did not have when you started the case. So if you think of it like an intel <laughs> also gathering, it's also very helpful because all of a sudden you discover layers to the case that you never knew as a CEO because the cases were being handled by two lawyers. So there are so many layers from you know, what the justice called the victims that you probably did not understand when the case was being presented from a litigious point of view, that all of a sudden you're discovering in the room. And as you discover these layers of emotions and information, you have the flexibility to change your mind as to what you want out of the process, which you don't get in litigation. So you can reposition yourself two, three, four, five times, and it's okay as long as everybody understands that you're trying to have a win-win. So through this process, you can actually develop, especially if you're there as a CEO, we still have a society that's very hierarchical. So your presence in the room actually means something to the people who feel that they've been victimized. They feel that you know, this big company has given them value because the CEO is in the room. If you're able to express empathy and respect, it often de-escalates actually their ask and de-escalates the situation quite successfully. And then last but not least, if you have a case that can be resolved in six to nine months as opposed to five years with escalation all the way to the Supreme Court and the Ombudsman, obviously you're saving a lot of legal fees, right? Uh, we can't ignore that, and I think that's, that's something that, that, that has been very helpful for us. Now, I'll talk to you a little bit about one case, if I may, that we had, which was a bit particular, but um, it's closed, so I think I can disclose the, the, some of the details of the case. Is BRD funded a building, which some of you know, may know in Yabugogo called Inghunda Mahoro. So we had a borough, which was a company called Inghunda Mahoro, and the company sold rooms that were actually the collateral of BRD without BRD's knowledge, and unfortunately the money did not come to lower the value of the loan. So under a normal lit litigation process, the conflict should be between Inghunda Mahoro and BRD, because you're trying to recover your loan, right? Logically. But actually were taken to court by parties that said, I was sold this room and nobody told me that this was a collateral to the bank. So I want my UPI. Which of course we could not give because the building was the collateral. So we found ourselves in a very weird situation where the third parties, who were clearly victims, to use the word used by, by justice, were now suing us and Ninghunda Mahoro together. So as you know, BRD is a government bank. So all of a sudden, <laughs> 
I had citizens suing a government-owned bank and the government siding with a defaulter to be able to fight off the citizens, which clearly were not given a true and fair picture of their investment. So even from a reputational point of view, you can imagine, I mean, that, that was very un uncomfortable. So through the process, we went to a commercial court uh, because we were sued by these 54, you heard right, 54 clients at once. And when we arrived in the commercial court, the judge looked at the situation and very quickly offered to be a mediator and moved to mediation. And I think we went through two sessions of litigation and at that point, uh, remembering the discussion that we had had with Professor Sam Rugege, I gave him a call again, kind of explained to him the situation, and he was like, Pichette, this is a perfect case for mitigation. If you miss this chance, like, you, you will have missed an opportunity, a golden opportunity. So that was our first case in terms of mitigation um, as BRD. So, uh, sorry, mitigation in, in BRD. We had many litigations, you're right, Chief Justice, before. So the case helped us to unpack what are the interests of these third parties, what are the interests of our borrowers, which at this point was a defaulter, and what were the interests of the bank. And as the case unfolded, we realized that actually there were much more similarities between the third party and BRD. So the alliance, if I can call it like this, shifted very quickly. <laughs> and we were able to side on the side of the third party and make sure that these citizens were get, would get their full rights, which would not have been able to do in litigation. The second thing is, this was a very, because it was 54 people, as you can imagine, there was a lot of political economy around this case. <laughs> so the, the mediation process also allowed us to kind of deal with the political economy and say, please back off. We are going to make sure that these citizens get the best outcome, but we're also going to make sure that we get a fair, uh, fair value for this bank, because of course, this is also your bank. It was a safe space, so there was a lot of tears. There were a lot of emotional sessions. Personally, as a CEO, I attended, I think, 90% of the sessions. I wasn't ready to see tears in courts. But in the end, it, for, the, for the third parties, so, the, so what we, we call them investors, um, I think that was, a, at the end of the process, they felt vindicated and they felt hurt. And actually, uh, that actually boosted the perception that they had of BRD um, as an end process. We did not take away our legal rights, and I think that's important. Um, often our legal teams feel like when you, or they threaten us, kind of, that if we start mediation, like, what about our legal rights? And the truth of the matter is, is throughout the process, you keep your legal rights. You can decide to pull out of mediation if it doesn't work for you and go back to litigation. You'll get a different judge if you've chosen the judge as a mediator. But I think it gives a sense of comfort that you're not stuck. You have the liberty to mediate, because at any given point, if you decide that this was not the right course of action, you can always revert back to the traditional court. Hopefully it's not the best, out I mean, it's not the best outcome, but it's also an option. And then finally, it provided a space for us to use common sense. I know it may sound weird, but many times the advice that we got from our legal counsel was based on an interpretation of the law, as opposed to what often felt to my business team, recovery team, and myself, what would be common sense. And that kind of empowered us as the business team and the CEO to guide the process, as opposed to being guided by simply, you know, legal rights or the, the confines of the law and the interpretation of the law. And that felt very empowering from, from where I said from. So mediation requires patience, I won't lie to you, because of course you have a lot of emotions. So there are days when you leave the mediation room feeling like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Why am I dealing with this? Um, but in the end of the day, it allows to, for change of, it gives you the flexibility that you need to reach an outcome on time. Practically, within Hunda Mahoru, one of the things that I really liked is that you actually set the timing of your mediation sessions between the parties. So that saves a lot of time because at the end of the mediation session, you decide, so are we meeting on Tuesday, Thursday, and then you meet again. So you are not constrained by you know, the, the time frame of the court register. You're not assigned a date by the court register. We love the court registers, Chief Justice, but sometimes the dates that we are given are a little bit scary for reasons that we all understand. I mean, resources are constrained. But with mediation, you're not tied by this constraint and you can actually decide the speed at which you want to to evolve. 
So in the end, with Inhunda Mahoro, we had 54 plaintiffs. We had an out-of-court settlement through uh, mediation with the 54. And we actually used the, the um, I don't want to call it jurisprudence, but we used the logic that we applied for mediation to actually conclude 82 disputes. So not only did it help us settle with 99% of those uh, of the third parties that took us to court, but we also used it to settle the matter with those that maybe were a little shy to take us to court, but were equally disgruntled with the case. So in conclusion, I just wanted to highlight maybe three additional considerations, um, because I was asked by the, by the team to also highlight uh, things that we see as risk from where we sit from, uh, from the banking sector. The first one is the role of the lawyers. Be very careful. I think this is one area where probably as CEOs, you may be more open to innovation than your legal team in-house, or in my case, I was very happy because the legal team was equally converted by Professor Rugege, but your, your how do you call them, councils, right? Your, your councils, are actually out of BRD councils, the ones that you use for the litigation, they want the legal fees. <laughs> so your interest and their interest at the moment are not aligned. So I understand in the US you found a way to have an alignment between the two. I think in Rwanda we're not there yet. So your legal team that is not your in-house legal team is constantly encouraging you to go back to litigation. So it takes a lot of resolve for you to hold your ground and say, no, 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 I don't feel like we've hit a dead end yet. Let's pursue it, let's continue. So be very mindful about the advice that is given by the legal teams, both yours and the opposing party. Um, in, in Hunda Mahoro, many times I asked the mediator to get the lawyers out. Uh, we'd reach somewhere, the lawyers would kind of take over the conversation, and the beauty of being you know, a CEO in the room is you can actually ask and say, you know, all of you get out, let's just stay with the real plaintiffs. And then we'd have a common sense based conversation and say, okay, now we're comfortable, let's bring the lawyers back. Help us structure this, but we know what we want. So I would say the courts are very advanced, the judges are very advanced in their mitigation, mediation skills, but the legal teams, I think Batonier will have to <laughs> work together because there's still a lot of work to, to do. So the way we use the legal team is we use them as a safety net. So to say, let's structure this in a way that if for any reason something goes wrong, we are protected legally, but we didn't use them as a driving force to reach the, me the mediation. Um, the second one is really around our in-house counsel. I think I was very lucky that my in-house counsel had been trained, uh, had attended many me mediation and arbitration training sessions. So she understood the process and she was able to guide me. But if there's one area where I think maybe that's for Tony, for the, for the Rwanda Bankers Association and, and Asar, is we need to have dedicated sessions to train our legal, in-house legal counsels to really understand this tool called mediation. And then finally, um, I can't help it, I spent 11 years in the Ministry of Finance, so I'm always looking at um, success and I think about how do we mainstream it within the government. Um, I think we're having a problem with mediation when it comes to government, Honorable Chief Justice, in the sense that decision making uh, around mediation today has to be taken by the chief budget managers. And for them, they know that the Office of the Auditor General will always look at it as um, loss of money. And therefore, they don't have an incentive to actually go to mediation. Because if they have a litigation resolution, they can just show it in the face of the, of, of the Auditor General and say, well, yes, government lost money, but the basis is here. Look, it's a court judgment, which, of course, the Auditor General is respectful of the court and take it as is. My personal opinion, and here I'm not speaking as a CEO of BRD, but more um, as a finance practitioner, is that the decision around mediation should be done by the Office of the Attorney General. It should not be done by the Chief Budget Managers. Because they are risk averse. What they are looking at is, will I be punished for taking this decision? Could I have paid less money, and how do I prove that I could have been paying less money? In the case of litigation, the judge decided that I couldn't pay less money. But in the case of mediation, 
it remains a subjective appreciation. So since we have a Minister of Justice who's equally an advocate of mediation, I strongly feel that his office, at least for the next five to couple of years until everybody understands what it is, should take that responsibility of actually approving a mediation settlement. And that would empower the chief budget managers to understand the tool better and make decisions faster. Because one of the things that everybody benefits from is time. And at the moment, I strongly feel that in government, we're not benefiting from that because the, f the decision making around the final settlement is so long and slow. The second one is really we need to train the officers in the office of the Auditor General. Um, what is clear is the Auditor General does not understand, the, their staff do not understand the importance of mediation and the benefits of mediation for public officers. So that could be a low-hanging fruit that would also help um, people who are here, because we all have cases that involve government agencies, directly or indirectly, to have a more open, a more open mind to mediation. And then finally, it's really training of the chief budget managers and the legal officers in government um, for them to also understand the tool. So sorry for being long, <laughs> but um, this is m the experience that we've had in BRD, and I think it will resonate with a lot of the bankers in the room. Thank you. Thank you so much, especially for the... <laughs> Thank you once again. Thanks for the example given in Honda uh, That puts more beef on the sketch and helps to know have the examples that de risks the sector. Let's go to CEO Prime Insurance. CEO Pichet has mentioned few things that caught my attention. Emotions, feelings, personal attachment, and trust me, insurance sector faces all those from sophisticated people, ordinary citizens, and one simple difference is it's our money. We paid for the risk. <coughs> the risk has occurred. Damage is caused. Why don't you give us our money? From the report, uh, the Excel sheet shown by the road justice, it shows the insurance sector is still low in uptaking the mediation. And the simple question is, what is taking the sector so slow to take up the mediation process. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Chief Justice, uh, DG, BNL, all protocols observed. Thank you very much, first of all, to, to have invited me to be part of this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, I had a moment to appreciate what Bruce shared with us, and I, I wish he could uh, live in Rwanda and become part of the, the drive to change things. Uh, yes, 40 years, if that's what I had, is what this uh, process has been world over. But I think in Rwanda, by go going by what I saw there, we're really not doing well. Uh, I think it is, uh, uh, it's not impressive. It might be coming slowly, but uh, now that it's in the hands of CG, I suppose we are going to get there one day. Uh, one thing I won't do, having spoken after the two previous speakers and Bruce, of course, the expert, I will not belabor the importance and why we need to go by mediation, because I think uh, the speakers before me have been very thorough and uh, really, if anybody is not convinced, then you think you have to go and, and block your ears, because uh, I think uh, if I did anything more than that, I would be trying to, co to convince the converted, which is not right. I will probably uh, only say one thing, that uh, this process is really what we need. And I think in Rwanda, specifically, we've had our own test of what, you know, bringing humanity to dispute resolution can be. I mean, if we didn't uh, opt for the gachacha process, we probably would be sitting somewhere, you know, with a, a million people languishing in courts, I mean, not in courts, actually, in jail. 
which would never have been productive to this country. So we have a history, I think. Uh, and uh, this has been more on the criminal side, but which we need to actually extend to the civil side. And in our case, to some of these, uh, what I call them, financial disputes that uh, we, we have to live with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So the way we managed to make that work, mediation can still work, I think. But what we need to do, and I think I still bring this back to the CG, the, the Minister of Justice, and uh, all the government officials, that for sure this process will only be embraced with a bit of enforcement. If we're going to sit here and allow judges or registrars or lawyers, practi private practitioners, to do it only when they choose to, will remain the same place forever. I had something that was a statistic that was very impressive from what I had Bruce <coughs> put out. He mentioned that in the US, today, 1% only finds itself in the courts of law. That tells you 99%. And then I think there was another figure of 5%. I picked both of them. But it's around there, whatever, even if it were 5%. 5% being the only ones that find them, them in, in courts of law for litigation. 95% is all resolved through mediation, which is very, very important. I think that is something we need to learn from. Today, uh, Pichet mentioned a lot of things I, I thought I would have said uh, from a practical point of view, why it's not working here. She, she mentioned the lawyers who see every single case as a way to generate f their fees. So to this day, their KPIs can never align with ours. Mm -hmm. To the extent that when you talk about our, our situation in the insurance sector, the presidential decree, the, the law itself, mandates all parties to first resolve issues of settlement through an amicable way. But at times, even where you present all, uh, let me call it, the, the entire formula like uh, my, my Lord Justice put it, the entire formula of what you would use to compensate and you're prepared to pay, sign a check the following day. Before you know it, you get a court summons the following day. Because this advocate simply is looking at his 500,000 that he or she is going to be awarded by taking this case to court. So what they do, basically, I'm sorry to say this, uh, by the way, if I, I sound a bit, uh, what do you call it, a bit uh, mean, you know that I was also once a lawyer before I changed my heart, so I'm something else. So I have nothing against lawyers. But one thing is that the, the practice in the market is that victims, as to where, are held hostages. They actually feed them on a lot of legal technicalities and jargons and promise them heaven on earth for two main reasons. One which is criminal and very fraudulent. Because they will have in the first place bought the case. What we have a lot here, and I think uh, CGs here and a few other government officials that need to be, uh, to, to help us deal with, is you get, what do, they, do we call them? Uh, uh, are they called accident chasers? Ambulance chasers. Ambulance chasers, as to where. You have a lot of would-be advocates and judicial officials that would be helping to solve these issues, actually involved in complicating them for their own personal gains. They buy these cases from victims, so for that reason, he or she must get that litigated because they, in the end, 
will have in the process forged documentation, enlarged families, created all sorts of uh, you know, fake IDs and so on with the assistance of local government. At times now, the cases we have been finding out, even in some cases, NIDA itself is getting involved in order to grow the, 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 the budget. So that, such a lawyer, however much he or she will have been trained by you, Bruce, or whoever else, will never allow a mediation process. I give you cases, we, by the way, we are one of those that are doing very well on mediation. We've had cases, I tell you, in Muhang alone, we had eight cases. Five, we've already cleared them. Happily, all of us are very happy. One of them came out to be a case where the lawyer had actually completely misfed the, the victims. When we started talking in the process of mediation, all the facts came out. Actually, the, the, the victims were like, why did we not know all this? Please, pay us money, let's go. So all those are possibilities that happen. But who is going to drive that? So in short, without having to belabor that, Mr. CG, I would wish to see one day here where before any case is registered in our registry, the lawyers involved are put to task to first present the process that they went through that involves mediation. If mediation failed, then that is understandable. But if it was never in the first place engaged, then they should be told, go back and try this process. That day, things will change. Today, the registrars are happy to re re record all this and, and cause all the problems that we know. I mean, uh, congestion in courts of law, we'll name it. Uh, I mean, the backlogs, name, 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 name. But I think we can forestall it by simply saying we will not re accept any case to step in unless you show us that there was an, a prior process that was engaged. We, so these are real ways to change this. Otherwise, my worry is we can preach some of these people I'm talking about are actually graduates of the mediation, uh, what do you call it, training that uh, uh, government has been engaging in for the last couple of years. I know the previous CG, Rujeje, the current CG, are all very big proponents of mediation. And a lot of private advocates in this town have all, you know, they need it as, a, let me call it, as an added qualification in case they want to, to be hired to become mediators. But in their own practices, they never want to engage in, in mediation. Probably because the victim is likely to give in, appreciate time, and understand where the, uh, what the, the, the elephant in the room is, beyond what they are fed by their, their, their own lawyers. So for me, I believe very strongly that this is a process that can really change the way we do business. I mean, if you look at the kind of monies that we as insurances pay out through these, uh, those uh, bodily injury uh, stuff, Unbelievable, probably 70-80% of our claims ratio goes to that. And at times, probably 60-70% does never, never, and mark that, end with the victim. Bruce might look, it might sound uh, absurd or completely out of, uh, you know, out of this world, but those are the truth in our environment. 
60 to 70 percent of those funds never end in the pockets of the victims. They end up in the pockets of those that hold them hostage. And I, want to, I don't want to use the words of exactly who that, those are. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I just uh, rattled the discussion a little bit. But uh, unfortunately, that's my nature. I'll, I'll say it as is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, a round of applause, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I will add not ask any other question, but I will, as we move towards the end, and this is uh, freedom of contract, that's what they say, if I may use it, what would be your recommendation to this audience as we end? Let me start with you, my Lord Justice. Any recommendations, experiences to be shared? Thanks. Uh, th thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, we currently have uh, in the, 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 the court system uh, nearly 5,000 commercial cases in the court. Uh, waiting to be tried. And we have uh, 20,040 cases, uh, civil cases, also waiting to be tried. And uh, nearly um, 600 administrative cases. Uh, in fact, uh, these, uh, they make an average of 25,500 cases, which all are eligible for mediation. So these, uh, if these cases would uh, be resolved uh, through the process of mediation, would remain with um, uh, a number of uh, complex cases, cases in which we have uh, complex legal issues where uh, the parties are seeking a robust legal ruling. And that is the business of the court indeed. Uh, but most of the time, uh, the judges uh, are delivering the cases and repeating their previous rulings. They have only to repeat what they have already said in their previous rulings. And uh, that is uh, um, time and the energy and the resource consuming. That one also, uh, most of the time also judges are uh, um, investing a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money uh, in uh, resolving factual issues, uh, in clearing a factual aspect, uh, matters related to facts. And uh, these are in issues, in fact, which can also be resolved uh, through uh, mediation. So uh, I think uh, mediation, uh, it, it creates, in my humble understanding, I'm not a business person, but in my humble understanding, uh, I think uh, mediation creates a room for a healthy business environment. Uh, it, 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 it creates the relationship of uh, business people. It creates a, a kind of a sustainability, a sustainable relationship um, uh, between the business people. And uh, as a growing economy, I think that is what is needed. I think it is, uh, it is something we need in Rwanda. We don't need uh, to see uh, business collapsing uh, because uh, there has been um, a dispute uh, of, uh, I don't know, a couple of millions where uh, one of the companies did not want to concede or the, 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 the one of the business did not want to concede. We don't want either, uh, I don't think we don't want either to see uh, that, that uh, the, the immigration of our capitals uh, uh, moving Rwanda, going in other favorable, more uh, conducive uh, uh, environment. Would like a, I would uh, think that um, uh, we need rather to create an environment where uh, uh, people who are not uh, feeling safe where they are, they will think that the best place for investment is Rwanda. Uh, so, and uh, we, we all have a duty in that. Uh, we all have a duty in that. The, the business uh, people uh, have a duty in that. But the judges, they have also to play their role. But uh, if uh, all the, 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 the issues which could have been resolved uh, through this process 
are sent to the court, it would mean that um, we cannot really expect high quality justice from the judges because of all these numbers of cases, because of the burden it is put on the judges, because of the budget constraint, because of all these things, they, 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 they end up becoming counterproductive for the conducive economic environment our leaders want for Rwanda. So my, uh, if I would say, a recommendation is that um, I agree with uh, uh, CEO John uh, about the, 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 the issues we have. I agree also with uh, uh, CEO Pichet about uh, the issues, and I think uh, we all know that uh, uh, the way uh, most of us as lawyers were trained in school were in adjudication system. And what is good is that uh, even now we are having this discussion, we are having this conversation, which, which is the starting point for a, a good journey. And uh, I can see that the future is bright. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe two points. One is following what John has just mentioned. I think in Rwanda we have a tradition of being half ready and then accelerating the process. We don't wait to be fully ready to make something, uh, to advance on something that makes sense. Whether you look at the way we handled Gachacha, we're half ready, but it happened. Abunzi, we're half ready, but it happened. Mutuel, we're half ready, but it happened. So if we use the same approach, which I think has been very successful for our country, Maybe my recommendation would be to request the Chief Justice. I was looking forward to having the Minister of Justice here because I know he's the one who's in charge of legal policy, to say, when I look at the room, 90% of the CEOs and the MDs of the financial sector are here. All my colleagues from the banking sector, from the insurance sector are here. Which means that as a financial sector, we are ready. I think what we need now is some legal leadership. So the proposal of John to say, can we now have it mandatory to go through mediation before we go to litigation, is going to create a little bit of discomfort at the beginning. We may not have enough mediators. The, the transition is, also, is always a little bit uncomfortable. But as a financial sector, we are ready. We are ready to have that as a prerequisite, and we are ready to make sure that the law forces us collectively to first go through mediation before we come to you to court. And I think that would go a long way in addressing the issues mentioned by, by justice. That's the first, for me, the first recommendation that could come out of this symposium uh, that would reflect what we feel as a financial sector, uh, Chief Justice. The second one is a question, if I'm allowed, because I saw there's a Q&A. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> to Bruce. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious, Bruce, to know how in the US you managed to convert the legal profession, the lawyers. Um, John talked about it, I talked about it, and I feel like in this journey, the courts, the, the judges in court are actually very advanced. I mean, I was personally extremely um, pleased and impressed by the level of, of, of professionalism with which the court mediation was mediated by the court judge. Mm. So this is a typical scenario where, you know, the judiciary is far ahead mm. of the rest of the profession, and I'm curious to know in the US, how did you get the interest of the lawyers to, to align to the interest of the other parties, which is clearly a quicker process with less legal fees? So that would be my question. Thank you. Go ahead. Please. Um, thank you for the question and thank you for the wonderful comments. I'm just sitting here marveling at the level of sophistication your conversation exhibits. And I think it does really demonstrate sort of the readiness for next steps. Um, to answer your question specifically, uh, needing to line up the economic interests of the legal profession with the use of mediation is critical. Because once that happens, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll give you a couple examples. In the very early days, when we faced such resistance from the Bar Association, as I told you, people would literally close the door in my face when I would ask for the opportunity to speak to their lawyers. Uh, mostly senior lawyers who would do that. And in one instance, 
a senior lawyer then called me up about six months later and said, I'm, I'm curious about this mediation process and I, I'd like to talk to you more about it. And I said, well, what's changed? You didn't want to hear from me last year. He said, well, AIG Insurance basically backed the truck up to my law firm one night and took about 100 cases that we were working on and moved them to a law firm down the street that was willing to try mediation. Mm -hmm. And so it's an example of how yes. client-driven the answer to this question is. And it's, I think it's been well stated by everybody on the panel, and I hope it came through in my comments as well. You need, as the leaders of the clients, to take responsibility for making those decisions that will determine your future as a business. And that means saying no to lawyers. I love your example of excusing the lawyers. There are many an instance where I'll take um, the lawyers out of the room or just take the two uh, decision makers for a walk around the block and uh, explain to them uh, the, the, the nature that needs to be addressed by them, not by their lawyers. To answer your question even more specifically, we have a systems of compensation in the United States where some lawyers are paid on contingency fees. That means that the um, interest, the self-economic interest they have is in resolving cases sooner rather than later because they don't get paid until the case is resolved. It also lines up with their clients' interests of trying to get quick resolution. So in those settings, that helps um, coalesce the economic interest of the lawyer with the mediation. In other instances, large corporations will put law firms on essentially a retainer, and they'll say, we will pay you $50,000 to handle a case from beginning to end. Therefore, that lines up the law firm's motivation to try and resolve the case sooner rather than later. And I agree with the comments about some of the, the um, resistance coming from government lawyers and people who are less inclined to uh, take risks in making those decisions. Um, and maybe we'll talk offline about some examples of how to try and address those circumstances. But hopefully that answers, at least gives you a couple, couple ideas. But thank you guys for the great Very comments. useful. Thank you. Maybe my, my, my last comment would be, as we wait for the message that we've sent to the Minister of Justice to arrive, <laughs> one thing that we can do in our own businesses, for example, what we've done in BRD following the case of Inunda Mahoro, is that we changed our litigation management policy in-house. So now it's been codified in our litigation management policy that all cases of BRD, whether they're administrative or, or um, uh, commercial, must first go through a round of, med of, of uh, mediation before they can be sent to court. That's, of course, when we're not being sued, when we are the ones suing. Uh, and when we are being sued, our, our team, now legal team, as per the policy, has a responsibility to first offer officially mediation uh, before they continue with the court process. So even changing our own internal policy can already drive our own teams to think more openly about mediation and hopefully soon the law is, will catch up and it will become a requirement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and yes. Sorry, Justice is raising an important point. We've now also put it in the contract. So even in our, in our employment contract, you know, there's always a clause that we never read that says, in case of disagreement, you know, the matter will be settled in the court of Rwanda. That clause that we never read. The, now we've changed it, and now it says the matter will first be settled through mediation, and then in case of failure of mitigation, the, of, of, of mediation, then it could be litigated in the court of, of, of Rwanda. So whether it's employment, uh, suppliers, I think Stephen talked about suppliers, suppliers, and, and all other uh, contractual engagements that we have, it's now embedded in our sample contract. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mine is uh, simple, and uh, again, I come back to our CJ in the room. Uh, I think the, the first fruits, the low-hanging fruits, lie with the judiciary. While we await for the, the uh, policies at the Ministry of Justice and so on to take shape, I think we can start with the what we have at hand. And today, I was asking my company secretary how many of the courts have been designated as, uh, you know, mediation, would, would I, mediation enabled, let me put it that way. Mm. And I think in her own recollection, there weren't more than 10 at the moment because it's going through, a, I suppose, 
a pilot phase. Is that, I hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. So with the 62 courts that uh, my, just, my, my Lord mentioned here, I think if we scaled it across to the 62 courts that are across the country and made it mandatory, I'm coming back to what you said and what everybody seems to be agreeing to, I think that in itself will be a quick win. And we could see a lot, of, a lot more cases being resolved through mediation than wasting time through litigation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. A round of yes, my lord. Uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, first of all, I would like really to thank the keynote uh, speaker, uh, but also the very distinguished uh, discussant about the uh, for the insight on this matter, and of course, from where I sit. Uh, I can't be more than satisfied by uh, the level of understanding uh, of uh, what we are really uh, try, trying to, uh, to, 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 you know, as um, a matter of awareness, a sensitization of people to embrace mediation. So I will comment on uh, two aspects. One is about the government dispute. Uh, and second is about mandatory mediation. With regard to uh, government dispute, that is a matter I have been even discussing with the Minister of Justice, uh, telling him that uh, it is about time, really, that the government embrace some alternative dispute resolution uh, mechanism, such as mediation, without really pushing, you know, citizen to litigation when they know that they have no case. So that, that was as bluntly as put, as I, I, I was addressing uh, the, uh, the Minister of Justice, saying there is no way that you are continue to engage, you know, uh, people, you know, these are criminy and the like. So we are discussing really about, about that. And it will take also, of course, meetings, uh, and, uh, and discussions so that they can understand that, you know, we are not rushing to court when you have no case. But even try also alternative dispute resolution. And we, were, we have been even successful as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. Even at the level of the Supreme Court, we, we, we got some cases where the city of Chigari was involved and the mayor of Chigari was the one who was reading the case, I mean, the, the, the mediation process, you can see that we are moving and, and I'm sure that uh, uh, the, uh, the process will continue that way. So with, you know, this matter of reluctance, uh, saying, you know, the, the, the excuse of the Auditor General, I am, I am I'm, I'm calling it an excuse because it is not, there is no way, and uh, I stand to be corrected, there is no way in our legal system where any matter is forbidden for mediation. Nowhere. So any dispute can be mediated, being a government uh, dispute and the like. So they are saying, okay, I am a chief budget manager, and we say, oh, uh, how I, I have managed this case. You know, it is a kind of uh, finding some uh, excuse. But as a policymaker, the government, I am sure the Minister of Justice, I will convey again the message to him that, you know, there, there is no fear to mediate. Uh, they, they have to embrace these alternative dispute resolution as we are. Uh, but also on that level, I think the government uh, is, uh, has uh, adopted, as you know, the alternative dispute resolution policy. So they, I'm sure that it is a matter now uh, for implementation, and this is the link to the second uh, comment I want to, to uh, I would like to, to make on the mandatory mediation. In the ADR policy, the new ADR policy that was uh, recently adopted by the government, there are recommendation, there are recommendation to for me, mandatory uh, mediation of some of some selected cases. So uh, we will be seeing um, the draft uh, laws that are uh, in the pipeline with the law um, reform commission 
are also in line with this, with making cases, commercial cases, family related cases, other cases mandatory. So prior to go to litigation, you have to, um, to, to go through uh, mediation. But again, I will convey the message uh, to, to the Minister of, uh, of Justice how urgent yes. this registration is needed. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it, will, it will go uh, that way. So lastly, um, I, I think yesterday we, we had uh, a session with for the, uh, the Bar Association lawyers. Uh, the president of the Bar Association uh, is here. Uh, he wanted to make a comment. I'm sure moderator, you will allow him to make a comment. Uh, I hope that I will be saying, you know, they are ready to, <laughs> <laughs> to help us to move uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, I know because he's a member of the advisory committee. So the advisory committee, uh, which has been pushing also for the uh, adoption of mediation by many uh, stakeholders. So yesterday we had the same discussion. And we are asking you, lawyer, why are not you coming on board? So I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, slowly there will be, uh, you know, jumping into the train. Uh, so, and I was saying, there is no way, you know, otherwise, because even internationally, internationally trend is like this. We are not having any single, uh, you know, dispute resolution mechanism. We are having a multi pronged approach as far as uh, resolving dispute, especially for a complex dispute as Mr. Edward was uh, uh, referring to. So we are in the process and I am very happy really, and uh, again, uh, I would like to thank the, uh, the financial industry, the leadership of uh, financial institution present, the governor, the vice governor of the central bank uh, who is uh, with us for, you know, um, responding to our invitation, but also very encouraged and very encouraged by uh, the response that you are showing. So we'll continue to, to accompany you. I'm sure the legal profession also will be uh, accompanying many people because it's about business. It's about business. Uh, and for this, I think we'll be moving. And I like the way uh, Mr. Bruce, but also uh, especially from uh, her background, the CEO of uh, BRD put it, as far the macroeconomic aspect of the matter. Don't, you know, as the, 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 the captain of the uh, financial industry present here, I'm sure that you understand better than anyone how, you know, creating a conducive environment is very important for our economic development. Thank you. Mr. President, do you want to make the comment? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable CJ, and um, all protocol observed. I want to make a few comments in as far as uh, what was mentioned uh, to do with uh, lawyers. As the Honorable CJ did mention, yesterday we had a session with lawyers uh, to make sure that they understand this process and how important it is so that it can be useful in resolving disputes. Uh, this whole mediation process is um, something that needs to be understood in a way. It has to do with, for it to be successful, we should understand so many factors that are involved around the process. And in each and every jurisdiction where mediation is successful, lawyers play a very important role. For, e for such a process to be successful. Lawyers and fees, fees and dispute resolution, they are things that go hand in hand. Whether in litigation, whether in mediation, whether in arbitration, whether in conciliation, everywhere, this is a component that has to be taken care of. Another thing that I wanted to ask the CEOs in the room here, here, here present, it's, it's very important that you understand, at the end of the day, we, we act on your instructions. And you're the one to make a decision in the process of mediation, at the end of the day. 
So using a high level of emotional intelligence as leaders to get the lawyers to understand that their interests are also taken care of in this process, it's equally important for this process to be successful. I have no single interest pursuing litigation for five years and getting paid what most of the banks here in Kigali are, are paying lawyers. I want to be honest with you. If I have to take a case from the commercial court up to the, up to the Supreme Court and then be paid two million for five years, there's no business in that. But if you're telling me that we can mediate over a case and then spend two weeks and you're paying me the same amount of money of two million, like for instance within a week, why am I going to pursue that case for five years? It does not make any, any, any business sense. But the truth of the matter is, you go to an insurance company, the lawyer in the room when an insurance company is negotiating with a victim, he's not welcome. Honorable CEO, that is obvious. He is not welcome. For single reasons, we see it out of the proposals that are being given to the victims. And anything that will be advancing in terms of the rights of the victim, most of the time, it does not sound well to the, to the, to the, to the insurance company. These are realities that you cannot run away from. We see it when these cases are being pursued in court. But then, if you, if you, if you persuade the lawyer, both the lawyer and the client, that they are going to get their interest within a limited short, short time, there's no single reason why a lawyer is going to pursue this case and take it to court. I don't want to, uh, uh, to, 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 to sound like we, we, everything is okay on our side as the Bar Association. Everything is okay. All lawyers in, in, the, in the country, 1,600, all of them are professionals. No. We know that there is a work to be done. We have actually even uh, um, struck off the role of the Bar Association, some of the lawyers that were involved in, in fraud in insurance cases. And we keep doing this. But then let's work together. We cannot avoid lawyers in dispute resolution. It, can, it can't work, I can assure you. And if you want to launch this fight, we will not succeed in this process of mediation. It's not going to work. But the truth of the matter is, can we make sure that the, 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 the interest of the, of the whole process is taken care of? Of course, the issue of legal fees, even in court, we are still discussing with the judiciary to make sure that they are taken care of. But we've got a lawyer's scales of fees that has to be applied. In one way or the other, this should not be a problem. But then, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing work that you have to do, all of us. And uh, uh, I, am, I am for sure uh, convinced that we are going to be on board and make sure that this process is not... Uh, uh, like undermined by, by the fact that uh, lawyers are not, uh, are not on board. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, allow me to, as we come to the close, just to mention a few takeaways that I have taken note of. One is that mediation should be made mandatory at all levels. And it is not one man's responsibility. It is a collective effort. Two, the financial sector is ready to take on the, the process. So this washes away the fear that the financial sector is hesitant uh, to take up the, the process. Uh, three, governments should take the lead. Like they have done in all other processes, they should also take the lead so that they create an example and de-risk a few remaining sectors. Four, there should be training for in-house lawyers, and this uh, at least builds on their capacity to understand the new concept that is coming on board. Uh, the fourth or fifth one, I noted it through the advice of uh, Blues and trying to reconcile, I was trying to do mediation indirectly from the Bar Association and the financial sector. Business owners should take the lead. They should be involved, and this brings back the role of logic and common sense and takes away the blame game between the in-house lawyer and the external lawyer. 
and this will create a cash flow for the business. At the end of the day, what is important is money, not the conflict. Lastly, it has been mentioned again, and I, I will not say much about it. I will just refer you to the New Times. Lawyers have the biggest role to play. I don't know how that is going to be done. Uh, from the New Times uh, article, I noticed that between 80,000 to 90,000 cases filed, only 896 were settled through mediation. And the register of the court overheard a lawyer advising his client not to consider mediation. I'm reporting what I read. So don't sue me. <laughs> Thank you so much. And <laughs> we meet again. Thank you very much to our speakers, contributors, uh, for a very insightful session. I'm sure there are questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Stephen. You've already ushered us, giving uh, uh, different uh, people in the room to give comments. Do we have any questions, comments? If you have a question before we uh, allow our panel to leave the stage. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chief Justice. Um, my name is uh, Bernadette Uwicheza. I am a practicing mediator, member of the Court Mediation Advisory Committee as an expert. And so I am uh, facilitating uh, the training in mediation. I would like to give here a testimony, and I appreciate uh, CEO Pichet for her contribution, saying that uh, the financial sector is ready, and um, uh, I appreciate that uh, the council of the banking sector accepted to that the in-house council, the team, legal team, recovery team, be trained in mediation, mediation advocacy skills. And in mediation, we can see a difference of attitude between in-house counsel who were trained and external lawyers who did take the same training. Uh, particularly, we are, I'm working with um, uh, Chief Justice Meritas, uh, Professor Sam Rugege, in our collaboration as mediators. And last week we had a case in banking sector, and we saw that the in-house council has the, the, the appropriate attitude in mediation because they were trained. Uh, but external lawyers, even though they are willing to come to mediation, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the skills, they don't have the attitude to support uh, the, your business. So. Uh, that's why we, I would uh, really recommend <laughs> your sector to help your in-house counsel, your team, uh, to be trained in mediation and mediation advocacy. And um, we conduct uh, this training in partnership with Susan, uh, Bruce's wife, and uh, we got good feedback from the team that who, uh, of lawyers in house counsel when this training because they learn how to uh, to advance the interests of the business but also to hear to listen to the needs of the other party and this can create create always a win-win situation so um, uh, we earn this process by here in Rwanda but also, I know that in Kenya, they have uh, next month a banking summit with all CEOs in Kenya and uh, under the, with collaboration with the judiciary to think about how uh, to get all the sector on board to adopt, adopt mediation. Uh, and one, uh, one, one, um, um, one thing that really help in enhancing mediation is knowledge and skills and uh, continuous training. So I would recommend uh, that uh, all CEO present um, encourage, you, encourage you to, 
to um, to organize those training with our, our association. We did this with the Bonkers Association, and uh, Susan can give you a testimony that uh, the team appreciate being this training, but also uh, external lawyers uh, who the training in mediation advocacy should be a criteria for you to use an external lawyer, because this is the person that influence, play a role in uh, mediation. So from, um, we are also Susan and uh, Bruce in um, a network of uh, pioneers of mediation worldwide. And uh, we're discussing with uh, other people around the, in different countries, what is going on in the, the banking sector is also this idea of uh, thinking the get together the policy mediation like uh, what uh, Peter has proposed, what can be the policy mediation in uh, the financial sector. So we look forward to continue working with you as a court mediation advisory committee of the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernadette. We have uh, the CEO of Sunlam. She'd like to comment. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on uh, uh, with my colleague, um, John, I think I don't know if it's because this training was going to happen, but we saw a high number of courts calling us at the beginning of the year, asking us to come back and transact and mediate. So we see a change in the way I think uh, insurance was not really taken serious uh, when we were offering mediation or transaction uh, for so long. Um, so we had something like 55 pending mediations in, in the court uh, at the beginning of the year. And then all, all of a sudden, uh, between uh, January to now, we received a lot of calls uh, from the different courts, co courts, and where you saw zero, it's not because we didn't ask. Sometimes we ignored. So our requests are clearly ignored. Um, so we saw a lot of yeah, calls for, to, for us to come back and try to transact and mediate um, so that the, 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 um, uh, the matters don't go to court. So I think there is something has started. I don't know where and when, but I think we can just continue on that and, and, and build on that so that maybe next year we will have higher numbers. But from, what I, from our experience, uh, you've seen the numbers. We see really even, I mean, internally we've changed. Uh, I think the association you've seen, for me, I, I mean, we dropped from 600 pending, um, pending court cases to less than 100 uh, just by saying it's enough. We, we don't need to, the, court, no, the cost of going to court is too high and the, the time um, is too high. So I think if we, it's, it's, it's just a small tick for us to go to the next uh, phase where we'll have um, almost all, all insurance cases being transacted or mediated before they go to court. Thank you very much. As Pichet said, let's start with what we have and do it the Rwanda way. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Victor Mugabe from the Kigali International Arbitration Center. Um, so I uh, just want to thank the presenters, the panelists, because from their, um, the experience that I've learned uh, now is that uh, at least the CEOs, uh, the head of this institutional institution have already like integrated the, the, the practice of mediation. So I really appreciated the presentation from uh, uh, CEO uh, BRD because she knew the process because she lived the, 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 the experience. So what I want to say is that uh, the initiatives that have been undertaken by the judiciary, the government of Rwanda and um, um, other institutions operating in this country like, like my institution, the Kigali International Arbitration Center, those are key uh, foundations that our country has put in place to make sure that this ADR processes, including mediation, are already uh, like uh, <coughs> implemented in this country. The figures that Justice MA has just presented regarding the, 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 the mediation cases that have been settled by courts, it's really a very good start. So I think before 2018, we've never like recorded these kind of uh, figures. So 
in the past five, five years, if you can record now at least those figures, it's really a good start. So there is hope that the future is brighter, as Justice May said. And uh, recently, as the, uh, my Lord Chief Justice said, uh, if the government has adopted the, the ADR policy, it's another like ingredients to, 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 to promote ADR in this country. So it's now up to us as the head of institution to make sure that we contribute to the attainment of the uh, uh, objective of this ADR initiative that our country has put in place. So if now uh, our country is now said to be like the, 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 the financial, the, the, the hub of financial services on our continent, so it has to go with ADR services, not only mediation, but here I want to say to, to also include arbitration because those are kind of uh, um, um, uh, dispute settlement mechanism that really contribute to the economic growth of a country. So I want to say that uh, um, the recommendation from CEO of uh, 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 CEO uh, Mr. Mirenge, where he said that uh, lawyers are uh, like uh, causing trouble in <laughs> the mediation process, I think this is uh, uh, something, it's a worry, it's a concern that everyone has. And yesterday, as the Batonier said, you had a discussion with the lawyers here. So, but I think it's a start. This me the professional mediation as you have it now today is a, a five-year project, baby. So if you can achieve at least the, what you've achieved in the last in, on, on five years, I think what you have to do is to work together all the institutions that are in place, the legal instruments, the training as you have... Uh, like undertaken several training with Edward Mediation, but there are also other uh, training coming in. Uh, we kindly request the CEOs here, please avail your legal persons, your people in charge to attend this training because the more they get training, the more they will like implement the mediation uh, and ADR uh, 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 exercise and make sure that we continue this kind of uh, interaction. So I would recommend maybe with the help of the CEO of BRD, if we would recommend a kind of uh, um, an one-on-one -on -one, an, an one -on -one visit to financial institution to exchange that experience, that very good experience that you have lived, I think that would, would help to make sure that uh, other uh, stakeholders, especially in the financial sector, really integrate the ADR processes because ADR is a very huge contributor to the economic growth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, yes, I was going to ask you to comment on that. Thank you very much, Pichet. No, that's fine. <laughs> that we can definitely do. I think we've been part of, of the process, as mentioned by Bernadette, and, and as, a, as a bankers association, we're always willing to to share our experience and our practices. I, I just wanted to make one comment um, on the comment made by, by the president of, of the Leo's Association, Batonnier. I think we need to be a little bit careful. Bruce mentioned that 40% of the time of CEOs is made managing conflict. And I think there's a high appetite for CEOs to manage conflict in the interest of their institutions and in the interest of the plaintiffs, the victims, as, as we've called them today. I'm not sure that there's an appetite for CEOs to spend time to bring the lawyers on board. And once the law is passed that makes mediation compulsory, if there's not a change of mindset by the external councils, one of two things will happen. Either the CEOs will increase their legal team and actually embed professional mediators on board, that's of action, that's likely. I think today the model that most of us have opted for is to have smaller legal teams and have more, a wider breadth of external counsels. So most of us have like three, four, five companies of legal advocates that we're using for litigations. That was not the case in the past, as you may know. So that's a business model that kind of in the financial sector we've opted for that we feel optimizes the outcome for us. But if we feel that going to the external councils is a costly adventure that is not leading to successful mediation, what will happen is that we'll revert back to the original model, which was to have a larger legal team that has in-house capability to actually break these mediation deals. That's one thing. The second thing is if the big legal firms that we're using, because let's be honest, 
the people in this room are not SMEs. <laughs> We're all large corporates, right? And what we're looking at at the end is how much am I paying and what's the outcome that I'm having? I was checking with Justice Aimé and I asked, is it a requirement to be a lawyer, to be a mediator? And his answer was no. They have priests, they have engineers, they have you know, all sorts of professions that, that, that can be mediators and I assume are doing a good job what it will do to your profession is that it will democratize what you currently have a monopoly on. Because for litigation, I can go not go to a priest. I have to come to one of the big firms and get a professional litigator to go to court. But once the law is passed, it's no longer a monopoly to the big firms. Now I can take a priest, right? If they have a good relationship with, with the plaintiffs. So I think we need to have an honest conversation with the legal profession as some of your biggest clients are probably in this room, to say, we are all having the same experience and it's not, it will not be about some trainings and minor tweaking in the legal profession that will you know, kind of be helpful going forward. I think there's a major change of mindset that needs to happen in the legal profession. And based on the comments of the Chief Justice, this will have to happen sooner rather than later. Because for us, I think everybody in the room has said, we have cases now. So we can't wait for you know, the big, the big uh, advocates to kind of adjust to the new mindset. We have cases now, we have cases in courts now, Justice Aimé is suffering now. So the minute the law will be passed, we will have incentive to move to successful mediators now. And if the legal profession is not ready, that may change the landscape of how you know, matters are being handled in the financial sector for a very long time. So I, I just didn't want us to leave it hanging because this feels like if there's one thing that I've, I've heard from the symposium is this might, mindset change has to happen fairly quickly. Thank you very much, Pichet. I think Batonier has something to say about that. <laughs> okay, le let me say something. Um, one, the truth of the matter is for a fact, uh, mindset ch change happening quickly sometimes does not work the same way we want it. I'm speaking from a leadership perspective. But then, the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, what we are discussing here is dispute settlement that has something that can influence the mindset change. As CEOs, that once this dispute resolved in mediation, can we influence and incentivize these lawyers that are settling the issues the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the cases in mediation? Because I told you, the truth of the matter is, I have no single interest in making sure that, it, it, like in, in, in spending five years in, 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 in a litigation case, where I can get the same amount of money paid within a week. But the truth of the matter is, we know that there is something that needs to be done in terms of like making sure that we make sh these lawyers get on board. That's what we spent a whole day doing yesterday. We had, uh, this room was full of lawyers. Trying to tell them, look, there is, a whole business in this mediation process. Can you embrace it? Another thing that may be that was not mentioned, the successful mediation process that happened, lawyers played a role in, in, in the same cases. Sometimes as mediators, sometimes as legal counsels. So let's look at the positive side as well. We know that there are problems. Sometimes they are influenced by those egos of thinking about their fees and they are threatened and so But then, the negotiations and the understanding of a lawyer in that very process might lead to a decision in one way or the other. But what we need to do, we understand that at the Bar Association, we are really doing a lot. Uh, uh, the court advisory uh, uh, annexed mediation that is working very hard to make sure that each and everyone gets to understand. We've trained a good number of lawyers with the... Uh, the help of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Bruce. So the, all these are initiatives that are leading to the, same, to the same line of ideas. But then what we've seen, we are a society that is traditionally meant for litigation. 
the change that we might want, uh, the truth of the matter is, since we are all now gathered, even having this discussion is a step that is leading us where we want to be. But then, uh, um, a mindset change in my understanding is something that takes some steps. But for the moment, we, uh, I mean, we are going to court, and in each and every time that we are in court, we are requested to go to mediation. It did not used to be the case. Of course, some are going through, some others are not working because of maybe how complex the matter might be. But then uh, uh, the truth of the matter is we, we, we actually want even to work with the financial sector very closely because uh, I've seen that it's the, the main issue that is, uh, that is coming up each and every time. Uh, I, we, I will look for Tony, I saw him here and, uh, you know, we can even call all the lawyers that are working for these, for these corporates in the room and then have an understanding. Let's have a discussion. What is going wrong? Are you being threatened maybe because the banks are not paying you the, in the right way when you're going through mediation? It might be the, 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 the issue to the, to the Rwanda Bankers Association and then we come up with a, a strategy around the implementation of this ADR Thank policy. You. Yes, remember Sorry. the insurance companies too, not just RBA. Sure, sure, yes. we, ASAR as well. Thank you, yeah. thank, thank you. you. I recommend that I, it's becoming a very heated conversation. I recommend that Pichette and, uh, and uh, Batonier sit together uh, on the same table for lunch and continue this conversation. And no, we'll start mediation, we'll not fight. <laughs> thank you very much, yes, and then Yes, we have, we have a mediator here. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to request, uh, we, had, we had a recommendation session uh, planned, but there's more recommendation coming and more that will come uh, during our lunch session. So I would recommend that we, the recommendations are sent to our emails and uh, we can continue this conversation. We have a whole week uh, to discuss this. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, Ms. Soraya, to give us her uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fiona, for the floor. Um, Honorable Chief Justice, uh, Honorable Judges, and other uh, judiciary sector officials, President of the Bar Association, CEOs, MDs, uh, distinguished guests, all protocol observed. Um, I am pleased and honored to join you today um, at this session of the Judiciary Mediation Week which gathers financial, the financial sector. And in the name of the governor and the National Bank of Rwanda, I would like to thank the Supreme Court for this invitation to this mediation symposium. And I must admit that uh, I've learned a lot. I was like a student uh, to learn about mediation. And I think uh, some of the panelists touched upon the need for public institutions, um, in addition to the financial sector, to really embrace mediation. I think we tend, as public institution, to think that if we go to court, we're already using you know, uh, our powers to sort of intimidate um, you know, the, the, the plaintiffs or citizens, and, and it's really up to us as well, uh, not only edu ed educate ourselves, but to make sure that we can mediation, and as we've heard, Many of them have already used mediation and are ready to continue that. Um, but I think on the regulatory side, there are still work to do to make sure that mediation is also embraced as a first step uh, and courts be the, really the last resort. Um, as Central Bank of, of Rwanda, or National Bank of Rwanda, what we have observed is that, you know, delivering unified customer experience compliance with regulatory requirements are some of the key challenges that we still see in the financial sector that leads to litigations. And it is important that most of the disputes that arise in our financial sector um, that stem from these challenges that we work on preventing them or addressing them. We have, and we know we are still in the phase of implementing the financial services consumer protection law 
There's a lot of financial education that's required. And in today's highly competitive world, the industry is also tasked with embracing a customer-centric culture, but also an employee-centric culture to significantly contribute to an increase in client retention, sustainability of relationship, as the Chief Justice mentioned, but also boost consumers' trust in the sector. But this cannot be achieved without um, basic and standard complaints handling management systems. And the National Bank of Rwanda took some steps to handle customer complaints by launching online platforms where we can monitor all the complaints that go to financial sector. But we see that the use of that platform is already leading to some litigation where uh, financial services consumers look at BNR already as the first judge of what the complaint is vis-a-vis uh, -vis their financial service providers. And as industry regulator, we also acknowledge that there's need to use more alternative dispute resolution mechanism. And from the discussions we had today, it emerges that they are most effective and that it is a more restorative mechanism compared to the lengthy and costly court procedures. But while mediation is becoming more prevalent, it is clear that intervention occurs after the parties have already come to a deadlock. And in order to provide tools for conflict identification and the proper analysis of the various options to address and resolve conflicts, it's crucial that we ensure that we build capacity in our own institutions. And by doing so, we will be able to guarantee that disputes are resolved quickly and professionally. And at the National Bank of Rwanda, we realize that upskilling our legal councils and our legal departments has to go in hand in hand with also upskilling our supervision teams. Because in the course of their oversight, they are also task with providing advice to financial sector, and it is important that they get these skills as well. From a statistics point, standpoint, we are also cognizant of the fact that the biggest percentage of court cases in the commercial courts and, commercial and the high courts are from either the banking or insurance sectors. We have also seen an increase of cases um, from the microfinance sector, which I think should also, be, um, should also be prioritized in terms of trainings and understanding that mediation um, is, is a beneficial and effective conflict or dispute resolution mechanism. And as I conclude, I would like to note that the National Bank of Rwanda is in the middle of conducting a study to examine the uh, objective and how we can advance ADRs in the financial sector, looking at exploring the suitability and efficiency of the mediation process across all financial institutions and financial sectors to gain an understanding ourselves of all the benefits of mediation and encourage it in the financial sector. And lastly, to explore the appropriateness of senior managers, board members, gaining mediation skills and being involved in the mediation process. So I will end by expressing again my appreciation to the Supreme Court, the speakers and panelists for this symposium. And we commit as regulator of the financial sector to ensure that mediation is considered as a first dispute resolution mechanism in the sector it clearly contributes not only to the reputation of the financial sector of Rwanda as a financial hub, but also to the stability and safeguarding our financial sector. So I thank you very much and wish you all a good day. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor. I'd like us to have a, a group photo. Yes.
I'd like to invite Chief Justice, Deputy Chief Justice Batonnier, members of the uh, Court Mediation Advisory Committee, all the present CEOs in banking and insurance, our esteemed panelists to join us here for a group picture. Photographer, please. That's very good. Of course, <laughs> Edward and Susan, please join us as well. Thank you very much, and uh, lunch is served at the Soko restaurant, which is just